Yes. Um, I'd like to take you back to the introduction to your talk. Mm -hmm. You were talking about the Victorian. Yes. And I wonder if you could elaborate a little on that. When I think of Victorian culture, I think of German scholars like George Eliot. Uh, I think of uh, Matthew Arnold arguing yep. for, uh, for opening up German scientific education and modeling English scientific education on it. I think of his praise for von Humboldt and so on. And I, I wonder how you see, I mean, Leslie Stephen is, seems like an exception rather than, rather than the rule of the Victorian period. I wonder uh, Yes, so uh, there was obviously a rhetorical move there. Um, the picture in the Victorian period as a whole is um, certainly more um, differentiated as you know than, than I suggested, probably. Um, what I would say is that they're very interested in the present German culture um, and what Germany can do then. There is what. However, it seems to be, uh, and that's still the case um, uh, in the early 20th century, um, what seems to be an assumption almost is that although German culture after you know, at the turn of the century is incredibly important and is going to be absolutely crucial to the way that you know, we need to re-import um, uh, education, ideas about you know, society, etc., politics, that in the 18th century, you know, partly because of the result of the Thirty Years' War and so on, the, Germany isn't actually an interesting place to look for historical sources and models. Um, and that seems to you know, have been inherited. I am not entirely clear still uh, when exactly that shift happens. I think partly, probably after 1790, they get so excited about a version of uh, German thought. Uh, th they being the British, that um, that a different version, a rather different version of German thought, which is the, the really the 18th, 18th century, uh, the early 18th century, falls under the table and is being treated as you know almost marginal. A good example would be Coleridge and Byron. I mean, they you know they learn German through you know um, um, uh, Gessner's work, but. Uh, so you know, there's clearly an interest there, but they think it's completely ridiculous. You know, it's this absurd, you know, uh, old um, 18th century uh, a, a poem that you know has nothing to say anymore. Um, and then they, you know, in other contexts, they're a little uh, more charitable. But overall, that's the and that's the myth that gets constructed very quickly. Um, and this is why I meant that it maps on rather handsomely onto you know, what is happening at the same time in Britain. That, you know, Germany only gets interesting exactly when you know, Britain gets interesting <laughs> in, in, in that new re rhetoric uh, of, of romanticism. Yes? I have a question. That was a wonderful talk um, Thank you. about the implications of this project for our kind of central narratives about 18th century Greek culture. Yes. Nationalism. I mean, I was thinking in particular about the place Methodism mm -hmm. occupies in those narratives, which is all about the translation of oral to print mm -hmm. and how sermons circulate and how they kind of mm -hmm. look like they're a handwritten oral mm -hmm. delivered sermon, but they written it in print and how interesting that is. And then to compare that to your image where you've got English and German and how this presents us with a rather different view of what we think about when we think about 18th century print culture and, and how, what kind of implications that might have for our narratives about British nationalism, if that makes sense. Yes, thank you. Um, so I have to admit, I ha the first part of the question I haven't thought about, and I think it's tremendously interesting, actually. I, um, so, um, in terms of the circulation, um, there is uh, there is an answer there, which is that um, <laughs> so there is a fabulous uh, resource, a fabulous book that came out last year um, by a scholar named Graham Jeffcoat. Um, it's a tome, you know, like this. Uh, he worked on it for about 25 years or something, which is about the uh, German printers, culture of German printers in London between 1660 and the mid 19th 
20th century. And, you know, there is a lot of material, you know, um, as, the, as the term suggests, uh, most of which um, nobody knows anything about. The problem is that, of course, and this is sort of you know, a pet peeve, the book is written in German, and I can already imagine, you know, how uh, uh, impactful it will be in, you know, history of the book studies uh, of Britain in precisely that period. So there is a whole incredibly rich description of the, precisely these kinds of things going on, and it's there. But it's also in the niche of, you know, German book history that studies Britain. And it unfortunately doesn't make the connection to the wider construction. So my, um, uh, I think, answer would be, we, we have to, you know, we have to be able to insert that into our, our larger narrative. And it's clear that because it doesn't really gel with the larger narrative, that we need to reconstruct that larger narrative. Um, it has a lot to do also with the kind of import and export of books. So, you know, again, book history, Raven's work is really, you know, uh, incredibly um, powerful. And he has this moment where he says, well, you know, I just didn't have, you know, the resources and the time to publish all of the, uh, sorry, to work on all of the translations and so on and so forth that were circulating. But, you know, their whole, just like Raven has that wonderful map of where the book uh, sellers were and so on, you can, you have a similar map of booksellers uh, that were selling, they were specializing in German books, for example. And they're often connected to these congregations. Um, so again, you know, and because they're often short-lived, uh, um, they're, they're hard to track down. Um, so I can only encourage lots and lots of people to do that kind of work, but I th because I think that you know it's very important and it's very helpful for the larger you know um, argument. Oh. Yes. That, that was brilliant and compelling talk. I'm wondering if Thank we you. can take you up on your offer to tell us about the Anglo-Germanness of Robinson Crusoe. <laughs> okay. Um, I wish I had a copy of the novel. Um, if you read the first two sentences of Robinson Crusoe, right? No, forget about you know the island and forget about him coming back and you know forget about the Protestantism and you know all the rest of it. You find out that his father is from Germany. He came to Britain. He married an English woman. Um, as a result, hmm? I was going to say, I pulled it up for you. Oh, brilliant. Well, why don't you read the two, sen the two first sentences? <laughs> All right. I just happen to know it's on Project Gutenberg. See, I can't do that because I'd be found Here out you immediately. Yourself. Thank you. You're so I was born in, this is Robinson Crusoe. Uh, I was born in the year uh, 1632 in the city of York, of a good family, though not of that country my father being a foreigner of Bremen, who settled first at Hull. He got a good estate by merchandise and leaving off his trade, lived afterwards at York, from whence he had married my mother, whose relations were named, <coughs> were named Robinson, a very good family in that country, and from whom I was called Robinson Kreuzner. But by the usual corruption of words in England, we are now called, nay, we call ourselves and write our name, Crusoe. And so my companions always called me. So actually, it's not Robinson Crusoe. He's called Robinson Kreuzner. Now, that, the interesting thing here is not just, oh, look, another example of Anglo-German. Um, you know, because that, that would be a sort of a slightly um, it would not be a very interesting uh, um, way of you know, proceeding. The interesting thing is that Kreuzner, you know, what does that do to the reading of the novel? And the interesting thing that Kreuzner comes from Kreuzer, um, which of course means uh, it's cruiser, 
So it's the cruiser of the of the cruiser that he gets on, you know, the the ship. But of course, uh, it's also the cross kreuz, uh, as in the the Christian cross. Um, uh, more importantly, uh, it is uh, actually this the name for the most common coin that was. Uh, in circulation in Germany, so a Kreuzer, um, which, funnily enough, um, was also in circulation in Brazil, which is precisely where, of course, he has his plantations later, and they still use the Cruzeiro, uh, right? So uh, this is a sort of redux version, but you can see how suddenly this is not just a random association. And uh, when when you take that together with the fact that Defoe writes actively about the influx of German migrants that are settling, and his proposal is actually that they should settle in the north of England, so something like Hull, maybe, um, you get a sense that that is not just part of the historical reality, but can actually, an attention to that can actually change the way that you read a novel that you think of, you know, most British guy possible, right? Robinson Crusoe, most British, you know, um, uh, novel possible, Robinson Crusoe. Well, actually, it's about an, you know, second generation or first generation Anglo-German immigrant that turns out to, you know, supposedly represent the British Empire. Which is, by the way, the, this essay of Defoe's is really interesting in that regard, too. Because at the end, once you have them for a generation or two in Britain, um, and you make sure that they're still as you know, good working and disciplined Germans as they ought to be, then they will be incredibly useful for the expansion of the empire. So you know, given all of that, you suddenly come up with a different version of you know, a different reading of the novel. Now, it's not the most important aspect of the entire novel, but it's important that you know, nobody seems to care about it, especially if you consider that larger context. Is that Mark? Uh, so I'm going to take you up probably on your invitation to uh, you know, travel up to North, North London. Uh, if you're there, yes. I'll be there uh, mm. at the end of July and August. Uh, uh, I thought that I had actually checked and found every um, mission of any sort, right, uh, that uh, had uh, intruded into Tibet uh, at a particular period of time. So uh, I have a sort of targeted question, which okay. is just uh, when you encountered that, was there a sense of, of you know, when, when that mission arrived uh, and, uh, and why? I mean, you know, of all the places, right, uh, you know, Tibet seems a tad off of the, uh, you know, off of the usual routes. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I'm really intrigued because uh, you know it would it, you know it would render them a group that did something that virtually nobody, nobody else was doing until the end of the 18th century, right? Um, and that was when they were beginning to have conflicts. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, Tibet actually then asked for a delegation right. uh, from uh, Tata. So I mean, so my targeted question is just so when uh, you know when was. Um, this sort of mission, uh, if you if you remember, um, and then uh, in a sense, are are the accompanied by like sort of because uh, my German's not great, but I can muddle through. Uh, uh, when uh, when is an important question, but actually more important to me would be are there travel logs and are those yeah. because I've looked at all the travel logs that take yeah and usually you have sort of a you know the dignitary you know so you know, George Bogle right so it's like the dignitary mission and then you look at the appendices and there's some captain going they've got this much gold and this much silver. <laughs> I mean so there's a very different sort of cataloging going on this doesn't sound like a colonial mission it sounds like something else it's can you, can you? yes it's very different so to answer the first question I'll get you the uh, exact reference in the secondary literature because I don't want to um, be on record and you know get it wrong, um, and now you've got me thinking: is it Tibet or is it Nepal? Um, you know, but uh, but either one would be fine, right? Um, so, yes. What is extraordinary is the places they get to, uh, at, and the early. You know, they 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 get there very very early. Um, 
little known fact. First uh, um, Native Americans to be converted to Christianity by the Moravians. Um, so, you know, it, once you, it's a little bit like red cars or something, you know, once you, once you, say, once you know about the Moravians, everybody's a Moravian. And, uh, so, um, uh, you know, Kierkegaard went to a Moravian school. Um, and, okay, so, you, and you can see the results of this kind of thing still, actually, because the Moravian church still exists. And, um, but now, like many churches actually, is in London certainly, the congregation is almost made up entirely from uh, people that originally were, uh, you know, came from the West Indies. Uh, partly because the Moravians over there are much, much, you know, more um, uh, institutionalized. And anyway, when does it happen? It happens early, you know, in the 40s already. Um, uh, and so I, I don't know about the exact mission to Nepal or to Tibet, but um, certainly uh, that that's, it wouldn't surprise me at all. Um, these missions are um, very often very small, you know, two, three, four people. Uh, actually, the reason why they get to London in the first place is because they're on their way to the States, to the Americas, um, which is where, you know, Wesley gets interested in them. Um, you know, you get these, tra well, and they're not travelogues, so to answer the second part of the question, and that's the really interesting bit, which is the kind of sources that you get from them. So the Moravians are, um, they really have archive fever. So they write down everything, and partly because everything is almost like a part of uh, God's liturgy, including, you know, um, your most what seemingly banal physical experiences, you know, your sexual life, uh, the fact that you're thirsty, all of this kind of thing. So, um, not that sexual experiences are banal. Um, uh, what happens as a result, though, is that um, they write. So they write all of this down in the congregation diaries. And each little congregation has these diaries. What is important to them is that they know and they are informed of each other's activities and you know what happens, basically, what God's ways are across the world. Which means that they send these diaries, copies of these diaries, back to the nearest headquarters, which then sends them further back to the you know, bigger headquarters until you get all the way to Herrnhut in Germany. One of the biggest headquarters that are on the way, you can imagine, would be London, which is why the archive there is going to be great for you. What happens? Those um, uh, reports, often written in German, sometimes written in English, are then translated, read in both languages to the congregation so that people know, the congregation knows what other congregations around the world are doing and get the most extraordinary reports, of course, from places, you know, from the Americas, et cetera, et cetera. That then, as I said, gets translated, read in both languages, and then sent to the real headquarters, which is Herrnhut. Um, and they keep it all. Um, there is a period um, uh, in, in the, 17, the late 17, uh, 1740s where um, they, they get such a bad press because they are supposedly, you know, um, these sexual deviants and so on and so forth that they, they, um, it, it looks like some of the archives might have been sort of selectively cleared, but there is still an extraordinary amount there. It has all sorts of fascinating, you know, re um, results, and I mean, this can this would be the book about the Moravians. So I thought at one point I'd then write, but then I decided that it was a bad idea. For, I, I'd venture. I mean, I'm not an Americanist, right? But um, I'd say first autobiographical prose written in America by women is by. Um, the Moravians that have come over here, these women write down their daily lives and they actually, you know, write down all sorts of intimate detail um, and then send that stuff back. And all of that stuff is in the archive. 
that then gets translated, or if it's in German, I mean, it will translate it into English or the other way around, and then gets sent to, um, made copies, of course, and then gets sent back to London. So um, I don't know what the exact mission to Nepal would, you know, um, uh, or Tibet would um, yield, but certainly um, something that would be of enormous interest, I would imagine. Again, they, they are, it's a, it's a weird, um, um, to talk to the point about whether this is an imperial sort of endeavor, it's a weird um, combination. Again, uh, about the American context, because I, you know, A, I remember that, um, and B, it's you know, more relevant here to more people. They're very troubled what they're supposed to do with slavery, the issue of slavery, for example. So uh, on the one hand, you abide by the laws of the land. You know, uh, Is it then a good idea to have slaves? Clearly, they're troubled by this, but then they do have them. They discuss all of this, right? And you can read it all. I mean, that's the uh, interesting thing, right? Um, so in some ways, they might be complicit, right? They would be conformist in that way, uh, in relation to the state anyway. But they are, of course, you know, in, in religious terms, wildly non-conformist. Non I mean, you know, sucking the you know, blood of Christ off the, his wounds, and you know, there's a lot of other stuff that is that's pretty out there. Um, so there is there's an odd mixture there. Um, and obviously, then it also depends on the individuals who went. You know, the initial mission would have been maybe two, three people. Um, Talk, so I'll be in touch. Yes, please. Yeah. Curious, thank you. Yes. Uh, I have a question related to uh, what you're mentioning, though, the sort of the very central process, almost very meta process of translation. Mm -hmm. um, and you mentioned that uh, to the Moravians, the, the concept of the idea of, of the speech of angels being translated mm -hmm. in, in a sense. I have always, and perhaps in a very uninformed way, thought of a Blake's interest in angels and the conversation with angels as being sort of a Swedenborgian thing. Mm -hmm. um, what you are saying now sort of changes that trajectory a bit off that. I, I'm wondering if there's are these two separate influences on Blake, or is there a tri triangulation of sorts between Hama and Blake and the Swedenborg? So, um, Great question, thank you. I think there is a triangulation. They're clearly both aware of Swedenborg. They would have read him. Um, I think the common ground is in the disagreement or maybe in the initial sort of interest, um, but ultimately in uh, a rejection for very similar reasons, in fact, for uh, being too conformist. So in the end, you end up with a version of angels that is based on a version of Christianity that is going to be far too... Um, uh, far too institutionalized and far uh, too little uh, connected to the individual experience of what it would be really like to you know, talk to an angel. So um, I think in, in that sense, there's certainly triangulation. I would think that Blake, uh, the Blake of you know, the marriage of heaven and hell, is much closer than to the Harman um, that is speaking about speaking um, and writing about or thinking even about translation uh, as translation, right? I mean, he, from the from the language of the angels into human language. Um, so uh, there are common sources. I mean, there are lots of uh, there are lots of uh, these types of triangulation. So there's another, you know, biblical literature, and the Moravians are one, but you know, biblical literature. Her James Hervey is another one. You know, uh, Young would be another one, where you have um, clearly an interest in very similar um, sort of sources, um, and the Bible, of course, would be the most important. But again, a version of the Bible that isn't at all conformist, right? Uh, that leaves space for um, very, very, um, well, unusual and to us highly counterintuitive um, hermeneutic sort of exercises. But I think that for them, uh, this is why I want to put them in relation, because for them, there's something that's very, very 
seems to me very important. Um, so as a version of the Enlightenment there, or a version of the period where that's possible, um, and where they're not, they're not, you know, two Looney Tunes. They're they're they're, they're truly, you know, um, serious thinkers in that regard. They're clearly very unusual, but the unusual is possible in that way. Whereas, you know, even 50 years later, after Romanticism, that's not possible anymore. Romanticism, in a way, they're too, they're too. Um, Extreme, I think I mentioned that, to be then absorbed into Romanticism. And in a way, you know, they both reject somebody like Swedenborg, right, for, for being too conformist. They would be, you know, they would, they would have followed Swedenborg and then they would have maybe ended up being something like, you know, uh, a romantic, you know, in Blake's case, when Hamann dies before the French Revolution, but, you know, um, a romantic that would be more uh, easy to assimilate. Does that? Yeah. yeah? <laughs> well, then we should probably thank, thank you. you. Well, thank you. Thank you.